I've been a pastor for over 45 years, and I've also simultaneously had the privilege of teaching in Bible college and grad school for the same time. So I guess you could call me a bivocational pastor. I've uh, been thankful to the Lord that uh, my two jobs dovetailed together, and what I did for the classroom strengthened what I did in the pulpit. So many pastors are, uh, they carry a heavy load. We all do. And I saw a recent statistic that uh, pastors, 90% of the pastors say they're putting in 55 to 75 hours a week. And uh, I would say, uh, I know that none of us would say this publicly, but we are underpaid and overworked. And so, what do we do about uh, the stress, the pressures of life? And I'd like to call your attention just for a few minutes to what John records in his gospel, John chapter 21. I'd like to read to you uh, three verses. The setting is the Sea of Galilee, and the This is post-resurrection. Jesus has risen. He said he'd meet them in Galilee, but he hadn't showed up. You know the story. Peter says, I'm I'm in the mood to go fishing. And it was uh, that evening, so they decided they'd all go together and catch some fish. And they caught nothing. And uh, the next morning, as the sun is rising, there's someone on the shore and hollers out, Have you caught any fish? No, no. Try the other side of the boat. And I'm sure that was a, of a bit of an irritant to fishermen. They've been trying all the sides of the boats. But they put the nets over, and lo and behold, what a catch. And Peter said, it's the Lord. And they rushed ashore, and after breakfast, Jesus fixed them breakfast. And the verses I want to read to you are these verses. After they'd finished eating, John 21, 15, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? No one is sure uh, what exactly the these modifies. Was it more than these other disciples? Was it more than these fish? Was it more than fishing? Was whatever he meant, uh, Peter's response was, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Now, I want you to listen to Jesus' next statement. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Listen to what Jesus says. Tend my sheep. Jesus said the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And we all know the story that Peter was grieved because Jesus asked him the third time, and we don't know exactly what all emotions were flooding Peter's mind, perhaps he thought about the three times he denied Christ and his failure. That was still going, weighing on his heart and mind, even though Jesus had sought him out personally. And, and uh, Peter had been restored, and they were back in perfect fellowship. Peter's grieved when he's asked a third time, and he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And for the third time, Jesus makes the statement, Feed my sheep. I believe what Jesus was communicating to Peter and to the other disciples and what he wants to communicate to us as pastors is that the motivation for ministry is not simply because you love people, as important as that is. It's not simply because there are so many lost and dying souls. But rather, it's because you love the Savior. You love Jesus. And 
I'm going to minister out of my love for the Lord. That means that when my sheep refuse to follow instead of getting mad or discouraged or feeling like a failure, I'm going to tell Jesus, Jesus, I'm going to be faithful and learn the best methods of preaching I can and seek to improve and, and seek to be a better leader. But Lord, I'm doing all of this not to build my ego or build my church or build my reputation, but Lord, it's to be faithful to grow where you've planted me. I want to be the best I can be for the Lord. And we're all so prone to look around and find pastors who have bigger churches, who uh, are more charismatic with a bigger smile, and they just have fantastic stories to tell, and they're such an engaging speaker, and we think about ourselves, and we think, well, I must have been behind the door when talent was passed out or, or ability was passed out. The Bible tells us do not measure yourself among yourself or compare yourself by yourself. God doesn't expect you to be like anybody else but the best you that God's grace and his Holy Spirit can make you to be. And what he does want us to be is faithful. So, in that respect, our motive for ministry is because we love Jesus. That means if we, they don't pay us much and they don't appreciate us and the people we poured our life into turn around and stab us in the back with uh, critical, harsh words and, and cause us problems. Well, what do we expect sheep to do? Sheep are sheep. And we're ministering because we love Jesus. And that's what he's asked us to do. And that makes all the difference in the world. Now, a second word I'd like to give and after thinking about the motive for ministry, is the uh, internal life of you and me. God wants us to be happy and healthy in our life. And one of the things that we must do, because there, you know, there's so much negativism everywhere. There's so many problems. Uh, everything around us is the bad stuff. We have to do the Philippians 4.8 and make ourselves think on things that are praiseworthy, of value, and noble. And, and then we've got to make sure that we're happy in our heart. I wake up in the morning and I thank God. God, thank you for protecting me in the evening, through the night. Now this is the day the Lord hath made. By your grace, I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I'm going to do what Psalm 34, 1 tells me. I will bless the Lord. And let me just give you a little uh, grammatical tip. When the psalmist says, I will, he wasn't just uh, talking about, uh, I'm going to strengthen my determination and try to do this. He was using... A, a, a construction in the Hebrew language which was self-exhortation. He was saying, under the inspiration of the Spirit, self, get with it. This is not optional. This is what God wants. Now, bless the Lord. And furthermore, it's to be at all times, and his praise is to be continually in your mouth. And I have found that to be such a blessing because it nips in the bud my desire to feel sorry for myself and to whine and to think about all the things I have to do, and I don't want to do them, but I'm going to be happy, I'm going to be praiseful, and I'm going to have the peace of God in my heart. I can't stress too strongly, keep your conscience clear. You can't be happy inside and have the joy of the Lord if your conscience is bothering you. And so if you hurt some family member's feelings, don't. Go back to this, well, God knows my heart, and I didn't mean anything. That was not me. They, they're just too thin-skinned, and they need to stop being so touchy. Stop that. Purpose by God's grace, you're going to put the gear in reverse, 
and just say, I'm sorry, I, God being my witness, I didn't want to come across with harshness or I'm sorry that that hurt you. Would you forgive me? I want to be a blessing to you. I don't want to be a discouragement to you. Keep your conscience clear. Whatever it takes, keep it clear. And spend time with the Lord. You've got to nurture the relationship. And the Bible, somebody says, your private devotions can't be in preparation of the sermon. I don't know uh, where they found that book, chapter, and verse. The, the, the Word of God is the Word of God, and whether you're thinking about how to apply that to someone else, in the process, you're going to be applying that to your own heart. And I think that uh, about every time I prepare a message, uh, I'm convicted and challenged and blessed and, and stirred up to be uh, more about what the passage is talking about before I ever get up to preach it to the people. Pray that God will anoint your heart. And when you stand up to preach, remember, preach the word. The most uh, important and inspired words that come out of your mouth is when you read the scripture or when you quote the scripture. And God has made a promise that my word will not return void. It will accomplish that which I have designed it to accomplish. So be praying much for your people. Pray much for your family. And keep encouraged. I'd like to close with Psalm 37 advice. If you haven't read Psalm 37 recently, I suggest you look it over. Don't fret. It tells you, stop worrying, quit fretting, quit uh, allowing your emotions to be squeezed into a wad because of evildoers and, and uh, the wickedness in the world. No one, God says, is going to get away with doing wrong. So make sure you don't do wrong either because we won't get away with it. Then verse 3, trust in the Lord. Trust in him and do good, do right. Verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Underline the passages that lift you up in the Psalms and review them frequently. Commit your way to the Lord. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently and cease from anger. God wants us happy. And when we get in the pulpit, remember this. Don't take out your frustrations on your people. What you need to remember is you didn't write this book, and I didn't either. And you didn't send your son to die on Calvary for people, and I didn't send my son to die on Calvary. God wrote it. God loves people. And if he doesn't change their hearts and doesn't open their minds, we're not going to be able to change their hearts and open their minds. So cast your care on him in the prayer. Get it all out of your system. Tell God, if you were he, him, you would dangle them over hell, perhaps, or you would put them under conviction. Or, uh, but since he's not doing that, you're going to be just as nice to them as it seems like he is. And when you get up in the pulpit, you're going to smile. You're going to tell them you love them. And you're going to talk about how wonderful it is to love and serve Jesus Christ smile and let them know. Let me close with something that shocked me. I heard a fellow pastor, he did a survey, and the survey was for the church people, tell me your favorite evangelist and why he's your favorite evangelist. Number one, he's friendly. Pastors, let's make sure we're friendly. We're not the evangelist, but we want our people to like us. Number two, the evangelist participated wholeheartedly in the worship service. Wow! He didn't have his hand over his brow acting like he's under some burden. He wasn't frantically taking notes or reviewing. He would praise God and he act, they acted like they enjoyed the service. And third, now I knew preaching was going to be in there somewhere. And third was they knew their name. They learned their names. My mouth dropped open. Where's preaching? It didn't make the top three. 
So gentlemen, don't be discouraged. You might not be the greatest preacher, but you can be a loving, kind people encourager. God bless you is my prayer.